these people are being tricked. They're being told something that has nothing to do with God. And I actually challenge that possibly they're worshiping another entity, not, you know, they call it Mormon Jesus. Um, you know, my bet's on Hillel, but um, as far as who they worship as, as Jesus, but not only one deity is worshiped for sure. There's multiple deities here. And one of them is Abraxas, who very rarely gets talked about. And, you know, it, it's got a direct link to Joseph Smith's mom. Aloha and welcome to the show, guys. Today I'm excited to bring on a guest who has a unique and deep perspective on a topic that's both intriguing and often misunderstood. Mormonism. Heidi Love, the host of Unfiltered Rise podcast, joins us to explore the mystical side of Mormonism, and we dive into the rich history and founding of the faith. As an ex-Mormon, Heidi offers insights that few can, shedding light on the spiritual and historical elements that have shaped this religion. Whether you're familiar with Mormonism or just curious about its origin and deeper meaning, this episode is sure to be an eye-opener. And to my dearest Ohana, don't forget to share this episode. Follow the podcast, subscribe, and leave a positive review. Your support not only keeps this show free, but also keeps growing our Ohana. And it allows us to keep bringing you thought-provoking discussions like this. I aim to keep this show free, but running it is truly, truly expensive. Something that I never thought would be so, something I just never thought that would be so expensive, but it, it really is. So to help with this, I include links with a discount code in the show notes. So if you make purchases through these links, it supports the show without any extra cost to you. And in the meantime, if you find it in your heart to support the show, Consider buying me a coffee or making a small donation. Every bit helps keep the show going. Now, without further ado, let's welcome Heidi to the show. I'm really excited to have you on today. Your journey from being a part of the Mormon faith is where, um, where you are now is something that I think will resonate with many of our listeners. It's not just, I think, leaving the religion, but I think it's the courage to question and to grow and to find your own truth. And so I can't wait to dig into that part of your story and hear the challenges that you faced and the wisdom that you've gained along the way. What was the most challenging aspect, I guess, of questioning your face? And when did that become a question to you, to question um, your faith? I had never questioned my faith until I got a divorce. I was kind of telling you, and then, um, you know, I still went, I still was doing everything, but it didn't really bring the problem into mind. I just kind of fell backward. Like I just didn't do anything for a while. Um, and then, cause I was married in the temple and that's really serious. Like when you get married in the temple, it's for time and all eternity. And it's all this weird thing. And I'll show you soon, but it's in the Mormon faith. It's like, you work it out. You're supposed to work it out. You know, it's, it's like, even when I told my grandparents, they were like, no, no, you got to go back. And I'm like, yeah, no, he keeps cheating on me. Like, I'm not going to keep going back. I mean, it's weird. And so, um, but <clears throat> so I had been away for quite a while and I met my husband and, um, he, I kind of mentioned it to him. He had got out really young and he didn't do all the Mormon temple rites and everything I got into. His family is extremely Mormon, though. And he said, you need to check some of this stuff out. And my mom had left the church way before that and became born again. And she had planted little seeds, but she was so careful. She was like never um, abrasive or weird with me. Like she just always was like, well, Jesus loves you no matter what. Like she was super good about that. And And if it wasn't for these little seeds and then my husband showing me he showed me a Masonic temple ceremony. And I was like, why is this on YouTube? This is not good. This is like uh Mormon, 
you know, private thing. And he's like, it isn't though. This is a Mason ceremony. And I'm like, what? What's a Mason? Like, I didn't even know. Like, they don't tell you any of this shit. Like, it's sorry. I shouldn't cuss. But they they don't. And it's upsetting because, like, you are doing far more than Masonry, which we'll get into. But, like, it's completely unfair that they do that to people and tell them, oh, this is about you going to heaven. But really, we're practicing Solomonic magic. <laughs> like, there's no way around it. Yeah. And so... Um, I started digging and I didn't really dig too far. I just knew that, okay, that's probably not a good idea. I became born again. And then I let it sit there for a long time. <clears throat> I became born again. That was good enough for me. I was just doing Christian mom stuff, like normal, just, you know, normal stuff. And then in 2020, I estranged from my oldest. So I didn't, she estranged um, from us, my oldest daughter. And she got married to this guy who's in a banking family from back east, which is interesting. And he's a pilot. I think I might have said something I shouldn't have, maybe. But so anyway, long story short, we were kicked out after meeting us three times and of the family completely like you just can't exist in our world type thing. And it really messed with me. Like it broke me because she was so close to me. She was my oldest. We did everything together. We were just super close and I just, I couldn't figure it out. And like, I never, I've had a lot of hardship. I've had a lot of problems, way serious stuff, but that messed with me. Like I've never been knocked down, like where you can't get back up. And I just reached out to God. I was like, please, like, I, I don't want to kill myself or anything, but I, I just want to die. You know, like I was so sad and I just was like praying, praying, going into the Bible every day, every day, journaling. And I was like, I'll do anything, God, like, just help me. And then he did. And then he called me back on that favor, <laughs> which is why I do a podcast. <laughs> so that's kind of what happened in a nutshell. So, wow, that's incredible. Um, so you were raised in Mormon? Yep. In Utah. I, I live in Utah still. Yep. Um, I always bring up that I would never do anything to myself just in case that comes up ever. Cause I do live right here in the heart of Mormonism, not to say that they would do that. I'm just saying, um, they're really affiliated with three letter agencies and there's multiple three letter agency hubs here. And it does make me nervous sometimes, but, um, I grew up here. My, my family were Mormon settlers. They were polygamists, um, like back, back. This is like in the olden days. And, um, you know, even in my DNA sample, it says Mormon settler. Like <laughs> you can't even get away from it. Like it's like there. I'm never gonna escape. So yeah. I didn't know that was a DNA, a Mormon settler. <laughs> yep. They got Kidding. they got well, you know, they are the DNA specialists, just for fun to know. Uh the Mormons don't own 23andMe, nor do they own uh ancestry.com, but they do own all of the information that pours into both of those outlets called mormonsearch.org. And they were the initiators of this process. They're hugely into genealogy because we'll get into why, but it, it is a huge thing for Mormons. And actually my grandma served a Mormon mission at home doing genealogy, just input and stuff all day long. And they do this. They find their family trees. Every Mormon is called to bring their family tree up. And so like people will know exactly who they're related to. People will know exactly where they came from. And so I think that's why the Mormon settler DNA thing is so easy to identify because there was only so many people that came over. So, you know, a lot were Welsh. A lot of people were Welsh. So I am Welsh. Yeah. So oh, Wow. Uh, yeah. So in Hawaii, we have a lot of Mormons here. Um, they, I don't know if they're different. It seems like there's a lot of different sect of, of Mormons. Some have the polygamy where a lot of wives, some don't. So I don't know the difference of all of them, but I don't know if the ones in Hawaii are different. It seemed like the one here, um, they were reached out from the Mormons, I guess, a long time ago. A lot of them are Samoan, Samoan people. Mm -hmm. And I don't understand why a lot of the Samoans are Mormons. It's so strange. And so they have a college here, the Brigham Young College is on our on our island. 
And there's also the Polynesian Cultural Center, which is a lot of Samoan people and other people, of course, Hawaiian and stuff too, but to understand why are they all Mormon? What happened where the Mormons reached out to them? And it's like, it's almost a thing. If you're someone, oh, you're Mormon. Why is that? Mm -hmm. I will tell you here in Utah as well, we have a huge Polynesian community. Um, there's many Samoan and Tongan people here in Utah, and they do have a big stronghold on their communities as well. And this is the mainstream church, not the polygamy people, just the regular Mormons. Um, they like to go and breach places that are pretty remote. And they come with a story of like, do you want to be with your family forever? Well, these are really family oriented people, including yes. Latin people too, you know, like Latin people, Asian people, Polynesian people. These are like family oriented people, extended family, not just like you yourself family, like their cousins, their aunts, everybody. And they know that. <laughs> and not only that, but uh, actually the Mormon mafia, what we call the Mormon mafia is highly included in your Polynesian center, which was started by one of the members of the Mormon mafia. And I can't remember his name. I think anyway, he funded it. Um, and I can't remember which one, so I don't want to quote wrong, but go back, watch my episode on the Mormon mafia talks all about this and he helped actually build and fund that Polynesian center in the seventies, which came from the money from Las Vegas and from the mob. And like, it's a whole story with Howard Hughes. It's crazy. And I know it sounds crazy, but it's true. And so, um, these people were funders of all of these movements and these, these people seem unassuming, right? They seem like if you've ever talked to a Mormon, which you probably have, it, a white let's say not a polynesian mormon because they probably have their own sex there right like they're going to have their own cultural way on top before but if you've talked to like a white mormon guy they seem so nice so unassuming so not even masculine no toxic masculinity like none of that stuff they seem super like um nice just nice that's a good word for it and they teach them this and there's a reason why the three letter agencies come after the Mormon boys and girls because they are very unassuming. They do blend in well. They are like part of, you know, all this stuff that, you know, you wouldn't think so, right? You see these people and you're like, there's no way. Like this guy seems totally fine. He seems totally nice. Yeah, no, you know, he's been quoted as saying he wasn't a baby cannibal killer. Like what? And, and there's people that this is a thing for now. Do I think the full Mormon church is this? No. <clears throat> we were just talking about this upstairs with my mom. And my husband said, do, how many people do you really think know and have like this knowledge, this level that you know? And I'm like, maximum 10%, but probably more like five. They don't know what they're doing, which is why I speak out because they don't know they're doing Solomonic magic. I didn't know I was doing that. I didn't know there was masonry involved. I didn't know any of this. And they don't tell you. All they teach is that families can be together forever. It sounds great on paper. It sounds good, you know, but they're not going to tell you about invoking spirits in the temple. Like this stuff gets weird. And, uh, you know, the leader and, and actual inventor of this church was definitely 100% summoning things with Solomonic magic. And I'll show that today. And, you know, this is the first time I, I've tweaked my um, presentation to include this. I knew what it was. I called it masonry, but we're going to actually call it what it is today. And I'm going to show some slides. And I, you know what? I bring receipts. I'm very much like Brandon Kroll. Love Brandon. I bring my receipts just like he does because, you know, I don't like to just say things. I mean, if I tell you something, it's been well researched. You can go find it yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And speaking of um, the magic, I had just spoken to a gentleman named Sesh Hedy, and uh -huh. he he writes books or he has a book about ley lines and the magic and the energy that comes out of these ley lines. And he's affiliated with um, Walter Bosley, which talks about Disneyland. And their ley lines in Disneyland. So, so I asked him to look into Hawaii's ley line because obviously I live here. So he was telling me these ley lines, these four big ley lines, and 
he said that there's a ley line that runs through Brigham Young University and the Polynesian Culture Center. And I said, wait, wait a minute. I said, that is a Mormons. They own that. That's the Mormon property. He's like, I, I'm not surprised. He's like, wow. He's like, I really would like to get more into that and maybe look deeper and into a, a more detailed map. He said, but I guarantee you that the people who put Brigham Young and the people who put the Polynesian Culture Center, they knew what they were doing and they put it on that specific fault or ley line because it brings out certain energy. Mm -hmm. I'm like, wow, that is crazy. So yes. yeah, so what you're saying is true. Mm -hmm. It's unbelievable. It, it doesn't surprise me one single bit. And you know, when we get into my presentation, like the things I'm going to show you, they're unquestionable. These go back to historic documents or court cases or things like this. Like, I'm not just going to show you a book and say like, oh, well, this guy said so. Like, no, we're going to get into it. And, and the thing is, is like, when, when you go through this stuff and you know all the answers, then it makes more sense. <clears throat> Why do they keep it so quiet and into the very tiny fold of people? Why do the followers, why do you not know what you're doing when you go to a temple to perform masonry rites? The same rites King Solomon, by the way, did. Like these things go back to Solomonic magic. And what was King Solomon known for? Demons demons and his magical ring and and like controlling these things and i'm sorry but like that is that is wild like when you get into these things even if you can say i don't believe in that say we're talking to an atheist okay i'm not an atheist i luckily didn't end up that way because you know a lot of people that leave mormonism do because they feel like everything's a lie and i get it like it's sad it's not god that did you wrong it's man that did you wrong you know so Remember this as, you know, part of my talk, because I so think it's important that we don't blame God for man. He didn't do it. Like this has all been constructed and, and actually forcefully done by, you know, summoning things, honestly. And, and it is not only Mormonism. This story that I'm going to tell you is, you know, multiple other religions and when i get into that i'll tell you but i just think it's so important that we know even if we don't believe what they believe right because it doesn't surprise me that they would do something like that it doesn't surprise me that they're harnessing energy why would they have people ignorant performing rights that doesn't make any sense right everything's about intention so why are they doing that it's all about harnessing this is a big loose harnessing. Okay. And when we get into it, I'll explain to you, like it has to do with necromancy too. I don't think that the president and prophet and seer and revelator of the current Mormon mainstream church, we're not even go to going to go to FLDS today, unless you have a lot of time, but I have a lot of knowledge about it. My sister married uh, Warren Jeff's nephew. Like there's a whole thing there. And that's the leader of the FLDS, one of the branches. There's so many. There's just so many branched off. But we're going to talk about the mainstream, which is the people that they always say, well, that's just some crazy cult over there, not the mainstream Mormons. The mainstream Mormons are good guys. They, they wear suits. They look normal. Okay. Well, I'm going to show you today, not so much, you know, and, and people can say what they want. They can shake their fingers. I, I'll tell you something, go find one thing after my presentation that I lied about because there's nothing. I mean, these people are being tricked. They're being told something that has nothing to do with God. And I actually challenge that possibly they're worshiping another entity, not, you know, they call it Mormon Jesus. Um, you know, my bets on Hillel, but um, as far as who they worship as, as Jesus, but not only one deity is worshiped for sure. There's multiple deities here. And one of them is Abraxas who very rarely gets talked about. And, you know, it, it's got a direct link to Joseph Smith's mom, uh, Joseph Smith's great grandpa, just for fun. We'll do this. His dad, he was Joseph Smith jr. And his dad was Joseph Smith senior, but that dad of him is Azael. Not Azazel, but damn close. 
<laughs> and you know, you just can't help but go, what? Like that's not even on his mom's side where the Scottish stuff comes from. That's on his dad's side. So. So yeah. I don't know much about Mormons. Um, I know that they have the 18 year old boys that go out for maybe two, maybe two years to go out somewheres, wherever they're assigned and um, preach, try to knock on doors. Right. Um, and I know that I spoke to them when I was younger, when I was probably 18 or 19. And so the kids were, the boys are talking to me here in Hawaii. Um, and they were living in a beautiful apartment complex, by the way, here. Um, and I guess you guys must fund that or not you guys, but the Mormons themselves with their monies funded that, that that's expensive apartment that these boys were living in. But the church does get 10% of tithing from every single member family. So if it's a two person family, it's your full income. Okay. There's no messing around with this. This isn't like you said so, um, because you said so no, there's something called tithing settlement after your taxes are done that you go sit in an office and you bring your taxes and you show them exactly how much money you made. And they want the gross, not the net. Uh, you don't even get like part of that. Like that's net. Like they, they are getting it on the gross. And so if you are short, if you come up short because you can't pay it or whatever, then they're going to not let you go to the temple. They're going to take your recommend away they're going to kind of put you on a little bit of a suspension. And while this happens to earn your way back into graces, you can work off that deficit by becoming a janitor and scrubbing toilets, which I did. Yeah. Because I had cancer and couldn't pay it. So what? <laughs> yeah. Oh no, that's awful. Yeah. And, and is this for all Mormons, the regular Mormons? Every Mormon, Kidding. every Mormon and the people that are on the top level, I promise you check their taxes. They're not chumps. They're not like lower end level people. They make enough money where their contribution is extensive. And that's, you know, they're, they're not the richest, one of the richest churches for nothing. Their top 10 holdings. One of them is Tesla. One of them is United health. Uh, I wonder why they pushed that little thing that came out in 2020 so hard. Cause they did. Um, one of them is, you know, Elon Musk's main right-hand man. His financial guy is Jared Burchall. He's a Mormon. He's a devout Mormon. Um, the, these holdings, you know, people can go look. Apple is one. They're very into transhumanism like approach. Like, and then you wonder why go look at their holdings, go look at their stake holdings. Yeah, that's so strange. But is Elon Musk a Mormon? He is not uh, on paper wow. now, but right. I will <laughs> tell you, I I mean, he has 11 kids, right? Or 14 or something. I don't even know. anymore. I don't He's know. Lot. I mean, that's Mormon <laughs> as heck. But like, I'll tell you, you know, his main dude is a Mormon. And, and it makes you wonder because the same thing happened with Howard Hughes. His main people were Mormons. Who's and Howard and Hughes? It, Howard Hughes, I the movie star. And he okay. built Las Vegas. That story oh, is okay. crazy wild. So that one's a really good one to look into to see where the money went from there because it didn't die. If it was just Howard Hughes, then it would be over with. No, no. This went into the Mormon mafia who then built out. When I say mafia, I don't mean like mob like is in the sense that we think mob. I mean, money mob. I mean, they control things. I mean, very wealthy, rich and powerful men that built Polynesian centers that did certain things that put their money where their mouths were. And, you know, they just happen to be top, top in the church too. Hmm. I wonder why. I spoke to this lady. Her name is Jesse. Her, her, um, episode is not out yet, but she was a satanic ritual abuse, um, survivor. Jesse Chesabar. Yes. Uh -huh. yes. You know her. Yes. I haven't had me... her on yet, but I would love okay. to. Yeah. Yes. So she said there's five top, religions in the world and mormon is one of them mm -hmm. and I, when she told me that this was a few weeks back i'm like mormon she yep. said yes yep. unbelievable do they do traffic child trafficking or human trafficking that you know of i mean definitely not that i know of but i will tell you i mean like if you look at the tim ballard case 
Uh, I don't know. It gets so Operation Underground Railroad. When that movie came out, um, Sound of Freedom. It's it's fake. It was heavily funded by the church. It's funded by the church holdings. It's funded by a church media program. It's funded in general, but Tim Ballard is accused, of course, accused by many women of the R word um, in these trafficking things that he was doing and they were affected and he is currently being taken to court for those things. Now, of course, it's just an accusation, but it's very interesting. I would definitely go look that up. Um, and the church's hands are all over it, clear up to a top, top person. And he passed away. Luckily for him, he did, uh, Russell and Ballard. And I will say his name cause he's passed away. So if you look at those ties, I mean, the church's hands are literally in everything. Like at the end of every single thing I go to, I'm like, good grief. Like I had no idea financial wise until I started getting into a different side of this. Cause my main focus was not there. My main focus was on the occult, uh, infiltration of this whole situation. And, and that was me just yelling out because I feel like so many people are misled and, and they're happy to be. So if I go tell this to my in-laws who are extremely Mormon, still, they're not going to talk to me. You know, if I try to talk to them, they, they don't want to hear this and they don't, they're care told not right. to, they're yeah, told not they to care. listen to this anyway. So Mm -hmm. and if i'm right so what they don't care you know so power yeah. follow power follow money you'll always get your answer and that's, that's a bad true. thing so i believe jesse you know yeah i i interviewed nathan reynolds also an sra survivor he speaks out mormons came up like it's just yeah. really? every time oh yeah that episode's coming and i'm just like mm okay, what's happening here? Yeah. You know, it's, I mean, it, it goes clear up to the top of the church and our current, I say our and my, like all these things all the time, because I was a Mormon for so long. Sure. I'm not affiliated or a Mormon anymore. In fact, I don't, I don't go to any church. Fool me once. Like I'm over it. Like I got the Bible. <laughs> I'm on my way myself, you know, like forget it. And people kind of shame me for that sometimes, but I'm like, no, you don't understand out here. You know, it's they, 90%. They never walked your shoes. You know, they, yeah. they have no clue. Yep. And I, I mean, I'm just like me and the Bible, like that's what I'm going to go to. Cause I mean, I'll read extra canonical books as well to study things. I have to read a lot of books that I don't want to study to be quite frank. Um, things I never thought in a million years I would need to know. But God was like, guess what you're going to do? Remember that favor that you asked me for? Like I came through for you, like help me out here. And I'm like, I don't want to read this. This is scary. You know, my mom was freaking out. She's like, I you studying Aleister Crowley and scary people. I'm like, because it like goes with it. And she's like, no. And I mean, I get where she's coming from, but like when you're led, I, I you know, I don't know what you do with that. And luckily I did because I would have not, not known anything. And I'll explain it all on this presentation. Like I didn't know anything. I was so naive. I was just like everybody else here. I was just a sheep and I was following. And I woke up in 2020 with that whole thing with my daughter. I didn't just wake up on that. I woke up on every, like every, it only takes one thing. Then you fall down the mountain, right? Like you're like, ah, what's happening? And you break all your legs and stuff. And then you're like, whoa, you know, you wake up and you're like, no, nah, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing this. I'm not doing any of that. I'm a nurse. I'm also not doing that. I'm not giving that. I'm not taking that. I'm not doing that. And they were like, oh my gosh, this lady's crazy. And that's fine. You know, I don't regret it. That's for sure. So you're a nurse as well. I am a nurse. Yes. I'm a registered nurse and I currently work in mental health care now because my brother <laughs> died. <laughs> yeah. I, my brother died of an accidental overdose about seven oh, years ago oh, I'm and sorry. it's okay. No, no, it's okay. Cause this is why I, uh, I called my podcast unfiltered because it's a warning and rise because you can rise above anything. Like the problems I have had in my life are extensive. Um, they're probably one thing in my life. Most people would have in their whole lives, but I've got like, boom, 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 boom. It just keeps going. And I'm like, okay, you know, and every time I get up and dust off, because I know that laying down or crying about it or getting on drugs or whatever the case may be is not going to help me grow. 
You can rise above anything. I'm not saying you don't mourn. I'm not saying you don't have a problem with it. I'm not, none of that. I'm not discounting anything, but you have to come up out of it. You have to come out of it. And, you know, if we all shared, right, like we would, I mean, I don't have my shit all together. Like here it all is. That's why it's unfiltered. Like you want to see, there it is. But you, you know, you can do something with this. My dad went to prison when I was a kid. I mean, I was a ward of the court by 12. I had really like a staunch Mormon grandma, but my grandpa was a sundowner and a one percenter and like in this motorcycle gang with my uncles and crazy stuff and like just crazy life, you know, got married at 17 because I was like, well, I mean, can't be worse than what's happening here. So, you know, we'll just move on with our life. And, you know, I've had, you know, problems with my kids, like I mentioned, the one and all these things like cancer and all this stuff. I had thyroid cancer at 37. I beat that. I blew my back and totally had to have, I had osteomyelitis inside my spine and I almost died two years ago. And I had to have a pick line in my heart. Like I seriously was really sick, sicker than the cancer. And, um, I beat that, you know, and everybody's always like, this stuff sounds fake. Like this, doesn't sound, I'm like, I know, right? Like, that's why I do a podcast, you know? And then my brother died, my dad died and all these people start dying everywhere around me. And it was just so hard, but like, you can do it. You can help and you can help somebody else if you talk about it and don't sit home in your own uh, sadness. You can help somebody else and it will help you. It helps you too, you know? And God can shine through a broken vessel. Like, I'm just a broken person trying to help broken people. And that's, you know, that's wow. what I want to do. So your brother, he, what did he um, overdose on? He had an accidental overdose of uh, multi-combination drugs. He was addicted to opiates and he got addicted um, because he had a legit reason. You know, there's, there's always something that is, it can get people, right? Like whether it's opiates or alcohol or anything like that. It doesn't matter what it is, really. It's your crutch, you know, and, and he had been a Gulf War participant. He'd been in the burn pits and done all this horrible stuff he had to deal with. And plus our childhood, right? Like this whole childhood. And my mom was really beaten horribly, like, and we witnessed all this stuff, you know, and when he would talk to me about his trauma and this is same for veterans that I take care of now. It isn't the war that gets them. It's the unfixed home stuff from your childhood that gets them first. Yes, the war set it off. But like there's usually something that happened before that. And you go how to you can't put it in a box as much as we would love to. Um, you can do it for a little while. I promise you one day you're gonna have like the jack in the box pop up. And it, and that's exactly how it feels. You know, you know, you're not prepared and you have to work through all these things, but he didn't. And instead he just, you know, was trying to put it back in the box, put it back in the box. And he, he told me I've tried all kinds of drugs. Nothing has gotten me ever until this. I, I, I wasn't prepared, you know, and it, it's sad because he was 37. It destroyed my mom. His daughter found him she was 12. Um, her, her beyond belief, his ex-wife still loved him. She killed herself a year later. Like, I mean, it is when you think of yourself, like if you were in that position as a person and you are like, nobody cares about me, I promise you there'll be 20 people's lives affected by your death. I can swear and promise you that's true. And so before you do anything or, you know, get to that level, think about those words because it's just the truth. Yeah. So I'm sorry. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. We're, we're, we're handling it. I mean, you know, my kids went through a lot that year. They lost their stepmom about three weeks before my brother died. Their stepmom suddenly died. Of, I think she threw a clot cause she was super young she was wonderful. Like she was the nicest lady. And, you know, it's just, it was a lot. My grand, by the time my grandma died at the end of that year, cause we'd had like five deaths, I think I was like, well, she wanted to be with my grandpa and she was old. So it's okay. <laughs> we weren't even, we weren't even that sad because we were like, well, I mean, all right. You know, um, and sometimes life is like that, 
you know, sometimes you get kicked a lot and, and that just happens. Like I've been kicked more than my fair share, but, and that would be easy to just blame a lot of things on and go lay down and cry. Like, but that's just not something, I mean, I cry sometimes, but like staying in that situation, yeah. it's not going to help you, you know, yeah. we've got to work through yeah. it. And then yeah. after all that, during the middle of COVID, you find out you have cancer. Oh, I had had that right before. So I had, um, I had had that at 37 and then, so that would have been a few years before that I had thyroid cancer and they had to do a radical, uh, removal of my complete thyroid and radiate me. And that was like really a lot to deal with. And then, um, you know, I got better, but the back thing knocked me down pretty good. It was after 2020, it was 2022. And that, that is still a chronic thing because I mean, it just didn't work out the way it was supposed to, uh, he put glue in my back and I'm deathly allergic to glue and it's on every paper ever. And you can't sue him by the way. So he ruined my life. And if he ever sees this, I hope he feels bad about it. Cause he got, he got away with it. And I don't know how that's possible, but that that's possible. So how did he put glue in your back? He just did it anyway. Uh, my whole chart said allergic to glue, surgical glue, deathly allergic. He just did it anyway. I was like, dude, I'm allergic, you know, and uh, it was also got infected and he ignored the infection for five weeks. And even though I'm a registered nurse for 25 years, I'm like, Hey, this is infected. Like, give me some antibiotics. And he's like, no, no, it's just the, it's just the irritation, irritation from the glue that you weren't supposed to put in my back. And so by the time I went in and threw a fit basically in the emergency room, freaking out. Cause I was on like a level nine pain and I've had a baby on my living room floor. So I know what that is. I know what level nine is. <laughs> and I was like, something is desperately wrong back there. And I had 1200 cc's of infection in my spine. Oh my gosh. And had to be hospitalized and, uh, for over a week and three surgeries and just draining it and all this crazy stuff. And, the pick line, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It never came off ever for three months because osteomyelitis is really serious and a lot of people die from it. And I guess I'm just too stubborn. I'm not really sure. Good. But <laughs> <laughs> That's a good thing. Uh, yeah. That's a good uh, thing. Yep, oh my made gosh. It through. Yeah. Wow. And I still took my kids to the amusement park with my IV in my arm. Like <laughs> I didn't ride the rides. I just took my kids because they deserve to have a normal life. But yes. my son did make fun of me. He was like, he's 16 then. He said, yeah, because I had to take stuff to flush it. And he's like, totally normal shooting up at the amusement park, <laughs> mom. And I was like, whatever, it's salt water. I got to flush <laughs> it, you know? He's like, this looks crazy. I'm like, are you having fun or not? Like, it's fine. And he That's just was like, funny. oh my gosh. Yeah, teenagers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but my That's daughter was sweet. very happy. Yeah. <laughs> yes, no, I bet. No. Yeah. Aww. Well, so, I would love to get into your slides. Absolutely. So I'm going to share my screen. Curious about a natural way to boost your immunity and stay healthy? Well, stick around. I've got some fantastic information for you. Hi, I'm Mia with the Sensible Hippie Podcast. Let's talk about the incredible benefits of elderberries. First, Elderberries are packed with antioxidants and vitamins that help boost your immune system. This means fewer colds and stronger defense against illness. Second, they have anti-inflammatory properties that can help reduce inflammation and pain. Perfect for keeping your body feeling great. And finally, elderberries are known to support healthy heart, improving circulation and reducing cholesterol. A heart healthy choice. Llama Natural Elderberry Gummies are a delicious and easy way to enjoy these benefits. Try them today and feel the difference. Go to LlamaNaturals.com and enter code OHANA for a 20% discount. That's LlamaNaturals.com. LlamaNaturals.com. So I didn't 
No. And part of healing what you do, if you have a spiritual problem, right? Like I started listening to a lot of Derek Prince. I started learning about like demonic strongholds or John Ramirez. And I don't care who you listen to. That's fine. You don't have to like them or whatever. Cause people have commented about that and you can think what you want, but biblically speaking, we know that there are strongholds on bloodlines. Biblically speaking, we know we put some strongholds on our bloodlines and we know that there are things that can do that to you. So I want to know, like, what what do I need to resolve in my life? That's where this journey came from because I, I wanted to know. I, I was doing all this weird stuff and didn't know what the heck was going on. So this is why I started even looking into this. I was like, okay, show me show me what I did wrong. Show me what I did. So we can't go forward to what I did until we find out what the heck Mormonism is. And this is a picture of Joseph Smith. He His story now, I will say this is one of five stories. So put that in your hat with a grain of salt. But there are five stories of this account of him receiving an answer because he said, God, what church should I join? And then he went into the woods and prayed because he read the scripture that said, let him ask of God, if you don't know something and he'll give you the answer, which is true. Um, and he got an answer, but he was overcome with a fit of darkness first, which is very strange. Um, and these beings popped up and they were God, the father and the son. Okay. You notice there's two apparitions there in Mormonism. They do not believe in the Trinity. So they believe the Holy spirit, God, the father and the son are all separate entities. And so they, they are separate people and they came to talk to Joseph and they were talking to him about, um, an angel that he was going to be visited by named Moroni. And a lot of people call him Moroni. It's Moroni, but the angel Moroni came to Joseph and he was an exceedingly white native American, which makes me laugh. I'm like, really? Okay. Um, which is whatever. Um, but he's an angel supposedly, but actually can't be an angel because he was alive once. So that makes him a spirit, which means, I mean, if you're talking to dead people, it's probably a problem, but that's fine. We'll just go with the fact that this angel comes and says, Hey, there's these golden plates in this hill by you. And you know, it, it's going to be a book of, of this America of our history, just like the Bible is the history of the people there. Um, this is a history of these people, this, this tribe here, these Nephites and Lamanites, and this is their story. So you're going to translate it. And for years upon years, I, I thought that he translated this book. This is on top of most Mormon temples, Moroni, that's the angel Moroni. And I thought he translated it like by writing it down, but we're going to, we're going to get to the point where I'll show you that's really not what happened. Also, we have to kind of examine Joseph's home life to understand him. His mother, Lucy Max Smith wrote this manuscript. This is from the church history museum library. I didn't write this. This is their information, not mine. Um, and also I, I think it's really important to let people know she was a Scottish background. And so also, I told you about Joseph's great grandpa on his dad's side being named Aziel, not Azazel, but super close, super strange. And this family was known to be um, a magical family. Okay. His mother was a healer. She was a known healer in the area. And I'm not, I'm not saying that's bad. I'm not, it's fine. But like this part gets a little interesting. So she's writing this letter to someone. Okay. Uh, to a friend of hers. So she says, let not my reader suppose that because I shall pursue another topic for a season that we stopped our labors and went at trying to win the faculty of a brack, just drawing magic circles or soothsaying to the neglect of all kinds of business. Okay. So she's basically saying, we're not lazy. We're not just drawing magic circles and doing treasure hunting. We're doing other stuff too, because we never endeavored to remember the service and welfare of our souls. So she's like saying, okay, we're still doing our stuff. Like, don't come at me because they were known to be kind of lazy, but that's interesting what she said, right? Like the part that I caught at the faculty of a Breck. And I was like, what does that mean? That sounds sus. And I found out what that meant. 
um, the faculty of a brack is related to Abraxas, and it's a god, chicken snake god. A lot of people call it. Um, this is just one picture, but this is uh, a known god many people worshipped back in the day. They even had rings like Abraxas rings and medallions and all these things for Abraxas. So, I mean, it's fine, I guess, if you're a polytheist. It's not so good if you're supposed to only be about like Christianity. So already we can see that this family wasn't like just a staunch Christian family, right? And so this right here is the spectacles that Joseph supposedly translated the Book of Mormon with. And this is the story I was told as a kid right here. So it depicts him with the breastplate of righteousness and these spectacles are attached to it that the, that the angel himself gave to him. But don't worry, you cannot see them because the angel had him come and get them back. He needed them for whatever reason. Angels need them back. So there's no proof of any of this. OK, but it goes further than that. A lot of people just say he's a big fat liar. Uh, he was high on mushrooms, uh, whatever. They say this whole big thing about Joseph. And I don't believe any of that actually um this is the truth about how the book was translated um this is what led me down a pathway of occultism that i never thought i would ever ever be in okay <laughs> like ever i had no fascination with the occult i never wanted to read about the occult i didn't care um but i did want to know what i did in mormonism and so hence forth i went forward and this is joseph with his magical seer stone and his hat he would put it in the hat and block out all the light like that last picture and somebody else would write down characters now these weren't words these were characters that they would write down and he um would do this in private and supposedly nobody hardly ever saw these plates um, a few people there's back and forth. Some people say they never saw it, but then there's descriptions that they say they saw it. Martin Harris. If you've ever seen South Park, have you seen the South Park on Mormons? No, you've got to watch it after this. You'll laugh. <laughs> so Google it up guys. It's on pieces and parts on TikTok because probably the Mormons took it down, <clears throat> but <laughs> it's true. It's like a really quick rendition and I should just put it in here. Cause it's so you funny. should. But, and, and it's true what he says. So anyways, that whole story is true. I have not found anything that wasn't true on it. So you guys can watch that for a quick little gist of it. But this is the truth about Mormonism. Now, remember, I'm 48 this year. This was not what I was told. We were doing the book thing. Okay. The, the glasses on the breastplate, still very Kabbalistic, if you know anything about the Kabbalah. But um, this is the current president of the church. He is 100 years old, um, speaking of loose grabbing, Russell M. Nelson, and he took this hat out and all of us dropped our tea like we don't drink tea, but um, but we dropped our Diet Coke or whatever. And they they brought this out from like the deep depths of the underground tunnels of Mormons. They have like safes and that's a real thing. Like there's a that's a whole nother story. But anyway, he brings it out. And we're all like, this is true. Like we all saw the South Park and we were like, that's such a lie. Oh my gosh. Can you believe that they wrote that? That's so stupid. That's anti-Mormon and it never happened like that. And Joseph had the Urim and Thummim and blah, 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 blah. Okay. So we get to now and he busts out the hat and they're like, what's up? We got rocks, right? <laughs> so I was like, what the hell? Like, this is real. Like, cause we knew from South Park, but like, I never knew. And so he found this rock while digging a 20 something foot well on his property. And Joseph asked to borrow it and then he never gave it back. So Mormonism is literally built upon a stolen rock, which is hilarious. But also you have to understand this led me to somewhere strange here in a minute because I was like, well, what, what can a rock tell you? That doesn't make any sense, you know? And he was known as a seer, prophet, and revelator. So is the prophet today. They believe that whoever is the prophet is actually talked to and given divine knowledge by God. <clears throat> and that God literally speaks to them. And that's how, like, the whole 
uh, letting black people into the church came about because it just happened to be 1978. No, I think it was 1980. It was right in that era. And they were like, well, we prayed about it and God told us to stop it. So I'm like, why would any brown person ever join the church? My niece is black. If she ever joined the church, I would freak out, freak out the way they treated them. Uh, it's, it's bad. So yeah, people that are brown or black, you need to look into this and, and probably not support the crap that you're in. Cause it's sad. Um, so anyway, Joseph has these rocks, multiple seer stones. These are three. Uh, I think total they had five. So he is known as a prophet, seer, and revelator. And he's also known at birth to be born in a call, which means to be born inside your sack, which is super rare even to this day, like with it sealed, like not, not broken. And so his dad was bragging about Joseph, even at his very birth, like, oh, this is, he's going to be a seer. He's going to be a seer. So that's also really important. So this <laughs> is an actual rendition from a court case where these guys got in trouble because they were treasure digging. And that's what they're doing here. This is actually like made at a later time from Willard Chase's statement of what the heck they were doing out in the dark. Okay. At three o'clock in the morning, slicing a black goat's throat and letting it bleed all over this thing. I'm sorry. That's not normal. And also, if you look at these symbols, they're going to come into play soon. So he said that the dad drew the symbols in the ground with a sword and that they let the animal bleed all around it. So just keep that in your pocket for a minute. All right. So this is Joseph Smith family's magical relics. This is the actual picture of it. And I don't know who owns this anymore. I don't think we'll ever see them. If they were owned by the RLDS, which is the reformed LDS people, they just sold their temple to Elon Musk <laughs> in 2022. And then the Mormon church bought it in 2024, probably from Elon. Mm. I don't know if it included these documents or not, but we luckily have a photo. So this is another photo just showing that this is what they are in this relic because I didn't make this up. Holiness to the Lord parchment we're going to get into. Can you see that okay? Yes. Okay, so do you know anything about Solomonic magic or the greater and lesser keys of Solomon? No. Well, I'm going to talk to you about it today because it's going to come into major play with this last thing here. This is actually a sigil and it has a ton of markings on it. And we're, we're going to go through them here in a minute. But, but also you have to remember Joseph Smith was supposedly a poor farmer an unlearned man, a man that could barely write, even though his brother went to Dartmouth. Oh, by the way, he was a Mason. He was a known master Mason. And his brother's name was Hiram, <laughs> like Hiram Abiff. So if you know anything about Masonry, you just had a giggle because that's like their whole spiel. And so his brother was a Mason. His dad was a Mason. They're, they're a Masonic family. So it's fine. So um, th that's going to be important. And Remember, he's supposed to be totally unlearned, yet what do we say at the bottom where this stuff came from? Francis Barrett's Magus? Anybody in the witchcraft or occult world is going to go ding, ding, ding right now? Sibley's Occult Sciences? Like, that's also a witchcraft book. Um, you know, there, there's all kinds, you know, the Liber Officium uh, Spiritum. Yeah, that doesn't sound right. Um, and the discovery of witchcraft by Reginald Scott, Scott. And so these books are not something an unlearned guy would have. Right. And remember yeah. his mom's supposed to be a healer, you know? And right. so he got typhoid fever when he was a kid and he almost lost his leg and he was sick for a long time. So if he's sick and in the house and can't work like everybody else, who are you going to spend the most time with? <clears throat> your mom, mom right yeah she's teaching him stuff on the side plus his brother's in college at this time at dartmouth people that yes it's the dartmouth indian college part because he was like going at that portion for some reason 
but I'm just saying it's still Dartmouth. Let's get real. What's Dartmouth? <laughs> it's like saying, oh, Dartmouth is like Yale. It's like Yale. Oh. It's like Harvard. It's like a huge fancy college. So I'm like, yeah, unlearned my butt. Okay. Let, like, let's get real. He, he knew some things. And what would you bring home for your brother if he's stuck on a couch or in a bed or whatever healing forever? Cause they literally had to do like straight up surgery on his leg. Um, and, and the physicians that came to save his leg, by the way, his mom summoned from Harvard, like the, the, how, how unknown of a person is she to be like, Hey, Harvard doctors, you come here. <laughs> no, no. So she did the right thing. She actually begged them not to cut his leg off because I mean, that's like a death sentence back then. Like it's horrible, you know? And she said, can you just please remove the infected bone, which actually is the proper thing to do, but it took him years to get over and he had a limp and everything for the rest of his life. So he spent a lot of time down. I don't know if you know this, but JFK, same thing. He was sick when he was a kid and guess what? He became an extra learned guy. He read a lot smart guy okay you're gonna bring home books for your brother like if they have nothing else to do you can only read the bible so many times you know <laughs> i'm sure he read yeah. that too yeah i'm sure he did because it's plagiarized a lot but how, well anyway. how does typhoid fever connect with his leg um it can go systemic and so it went oh. systemic with him and he got super sick and and so it's important just to know that background on him and he did recover and and he made a full recovery except the limp but i think it's really important to know that he was definitely had downtime you know yeah he could do anything mm -hmm. and so um then this is really important this is something that he always wore this is called a jupiter talisman they call it the Jupiter talisman because these, these markings on here are, I didn't know what they were necessarily before. I did know that they look like Enochian magic, mm -hmm. but they're not, they're Solomonic magic. And I'll, I'll oh. show you why I know that. Cause here, see, look at this right here. And then I'll go back again and I'll blow it up. There you go. See that? Yeah, it's, it's like identical. So whoops. And then so that's really important to know. Because it proves that he definitely read and was familiar with the lesser and greater keys of Solomon. And these are books that are just not Christian. Okay, like, yeah, they're magical books. Yeah. And I mean, I don't know what else to say about that. Like, that's just what it is. And so, I mean, it's very much um, identical. Um, it has, it's talking about, you know, it's going to protect those who invoke it and cause the spirits to come when they appear and show them this pentacle and, and they shouldn't be able to attack you. Okay. And they'll immediately wow. obey. Uh, obey is the word. I see Jehovah's so, name in there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But you kind of wonder like exactly how they tie that all together. Right. Mm -hmm. So the names of Adonai is also in there. Um, and there is a Psalms in there. And of course they mix it together, you know, because King Solomon wasn't totally evil, like he just mm -hmm. wasn't. And so he was, he was still, you know, God-ish. Yeah. <laughs> he liked to mess with demons. Yeah. Yeah. And well, then, his wives, right. All his wives. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yep. They were into this. And then yeah. these two sigils, are on that first page that I showed you guys. And you can go back and like compare them side by side, but these are on that holiness to the Lord parchment. And it says, uh, whoso beareth this, uh, about him, all spirits shall, uh, have to pay him homage. Okay. So this is on that parchment that he has this one and this one, they both are. And this one says he shall not have to fear anyone, but God. And so I'll go back really quick so you can see too. I need to make a side by side, but I barely added these today. So those two circle wheels, mm -hmm. and it's important to know whenever anything is in a seal like that, it is a closed, um, spirit type communication, but if it's open and it's out, then it's, it's a direct and, and they are like working with those spirits. And this one is Raphael. And it doesn't have a seal around it, right? Oh, because if yeah. you have a seal, you're kind of controlling them. You know, you're you're imprisoning mm -hmm. them, so to speak. But if it's open, you're working with them, like literally mm -hmm. working with them. And then, so 
it's got multiple we're gonna run into multiple different um spirits yeah Ju- jubanla dance or dace i'm not sure how to pronounce that but anyways the one of these symbols led me to john d <clears throat> i had no idea who john d was nor did i care I yeah i'll tell you like okay. i didn't care about any of this you know like people that are fascinated with this all their lives like i do now but not before and so i was like what is this symbol what is this i was trying to figure it out before i figured it out and i looked it up and the only place that Ju- juban ladace is is cited said something about this guy named john d and i'm like who the hell is that like what it's like a never-ending rabbit hole of occultism <laughs> so i'm like okay i guess i'll look this guy up right and i became really like really dived in dove into his stuff and he actually does enochian magic which is a little bit different but also what happens right he he summons spirits and do you know the story about john d no okay let me tell you okay so he also was hearing from god and he also was getting messages from angels and he was doing workings with this guy named edward kelly and funny enough he would use a black scrying mirror, which was actually not a mirror. It was obsidian, a stone, and they would block out all the light. Sound familiar? <laughs> and the guy would say these symbols and they would write them down. And that became a book. Does that sound really familiar? Yes. So, yeah. So also funny enough, Muhammad would travel out in the wilderness he had scribes that went with him but they weren't scribes they like memorized everything because they were non-written people but eventually they did write this down but he would have fits of darkness come over him and he would wake up and say things and they would memorize them and it became a book because also he was having angels speak to him and what happens it becomes a religion so does this so does let's do a fun one let's do crowley crowley didn't have to see an angel because he didn't care about angels but he sure enough did see an alien right and so we get the book of the law because he saw an alien quote unquote alien and then he writes a book and it becomes the book of the law which becomes the lima which becomes a religion we can do l ron hubbard and jack parsons doing babylon workings out in the desert we don't want to talk about what they were doing because it was gross but all of these people had some price to pay it never whenever god is working in your life he, he's not going to say hey john d let Edward Kelly bang your wife and then he she's going to get knocked up with a kid and you have to raise it the rest of your life and you guys switch wives and all this stuff and that sounds like a great plan because the angels said to do that does that sound angelic I don't think it does like no mm. yeah I think at that point he was all in he did these workings for eight years and he is the one where we get the Enochian alphabet from and really? so Yes. He was the one that came up. Well, he didn't come up with it. He just wrote it down mm-hmm. and they told him this, these angels told him this, and it is actually an alphabet that, that stands the test of time. Like it's still to this day, an actual language that you can use to communicate. So if Ugh. he really made that up, like Edward Kelly was the scribe, cause he was like super brainiac smart and he couldn't like relax enough to communicate. So they, the other guy did it and he wrote the stuff down. But like, I'm sorry, it wouldn't last, you know, if it, if it wasn't like, you're telling me this guy that got his ears cut off for being a swindler and he's just this chump guy made up a whole language. No, I'm no, it, I a hundred percent believe in things that we can't see. And if you yeah. don't, that's okay. You know, but I'm telling you, these people did things that they would never do. Like John D was a really pious man. He would not just share his wife. In fact, his wife hated Edward Kelly and she wanted nothing to do with it. And also John D didn't want to do it. And they still did it over and over. These people were tested and tried and they were like given impossible things. And even one time Edward Kelly talked to the angels about like, Hey, we need some money because like, you want us to do these books and we're broke. And they were like, no. And plus you guys stink and you need to start taking more showers and you need to get married. And then he came back married and they were like, why are you married? And he's like, 
what? I hate her. Like, I hate my wife. Why did you make me get married if you don't want me married? And they would mess with them like this all the time. That's not God. Like, no. And then, yeah, Jack Parsons, what happens to him? Oh, L. Ron Hubbard steals his chick after this. And then he blows himself up. Like, that doesn't sound like a good time, right? <laughs> like, what? And then on top of it, like, you've got Mormonism with polygamy. You've got Muhammad with the little kids. And I'm sorry, but he had a wife that was like six. And they made that, sealed that deal at eight, apparently. Now they say she had precocious puberty and that it was all good to go. I'm just saying like, meh. And also polygamy, every single one of them have some price to pay, right? Like some sexual sin, really. It's sex. It's sex magic. And mm -hmm. so when I ran into that and then put it all together with everything, I was like, what the heck is going on here? So I didn't put together the Solomonic end of it until later. But when I run into this, this is like 110%. Like this is like, I mean, it's the same thing. It's not... It's not like it's a little the same. No, it's a, it's like a replica. And so, so are these. And so, yeah. you know, when you get into the keys of Solomon, like I said, you can do whatever you want. I'm not against people that want to mess with this stuff. Go ahead, do it. But you know what? You can't lie to good God-fearing people and tell them, hey, this is about you going to heaven. No, that's wrong. That's wrong. That's why I speak out. Mm -hmm. And these are some of the other characters on there on that same sheet. And there's more angels on here, you know, like pay, pay, Haley Pa, who protects virgins from debauchery. And, and then there's the Jew Bamba dance. And then there's all, all these different ones. Like I've got them on here so that people can do their own research. They can, these directly came off of that, that sigil. So um, again, Jupiter, he's super into Jupiter, um, and, and the power that Jupiter holds, you know, and all, all of this stuff, all of these are on here, Raphael, um, all of these. So again, here's another, um, from the actual occult sciences book about Juban Lodance. And, and so it talks about what is he over? He's the appointed guardian of all public and national enterprises. Put that together with what Jesse said and yeah. tell me that that's not still happening. Bull. Yeah. yeah. And then and this says, is from, sorry, this is from your books. This is actually from the occult sciences, Ebenezer Sibley book, which was published clear back in 1807. Okay. And that this directly, this sig insignia comes off of these parchments that I'm showing you that, that he actually had in his um, presence at death. They tried to blame it on the brother, but I'll tell you why that's bull crap in a minute. And it says you wear it as a layman around the neck, like that picture that I showed um, with the little pouch around the neck. And he had one of those pouches and they were inside that pouch. And so I also thought it was hysterical today when I went to go download um, the greater, C <laughs> greater Keys of Solomon. I got it on usarchive.org. It's free. But look who look who digitized it for us. Oh, thank you, Brigham Young University. Oh, oh my God. Thanks. You You're keep so going down it. these rabbit holes. Wow. Oh, it's big. And this is also one of the pentacles found in the Seal of Solomon, the Great Pentacle. This to the right, which do you see the similarity here and here? It's not exact, but it's very similar, right? This is squares yes. and these, these aren't perfect squares, but this is actually the seal. Right. Funny enough, they call it the seal of Melchizedek. Also, if you notice, they don't have a circle around their seal. So. Wow. Funny. Now I know yeah. about this. I got to, I got to watch. That's crazy. This is the second parchment that he had. And this is that Juban Lades, um angel or demon, whatever you want to call it, but also no seal around it working with this one. This is the one over government that I just told you about. Um, I see pe Jehovah, pentagrams. Jehovah, Jehovah everywhere. Yep. Yep. This is called the Jehovah, Jehovah, Jehovah parchment. And this oh. is another seal from the keys of Solomon. 
And I'm like, okay, the, this is nuts. Also, the Maltese cross is in here. Like, there's a, you, you guys can go study this, but this is like, I, cause I have to make it kind of brief ish, cause there's a lot of slides. But, mm. and then this one also is the last one. And as it says on the top, Joseph Smith Sr. and Joseph Smith Jr. were probably the ones that owned these, but they were inherited by the brother Hiram after the death, which makes complete sense because. His wife, Emma, wasn't into this whole treasure digging crap. She didn't like anything to do with it. She was not happy that he was into it. She loved him very much, but she didn't, I wouldn't think she wouldn't want this back. So I'm not surprised that Hiram ended up with it, but you have, have to remember he was off at college. Who was the treasure digger? Who had the actual ticket, which I'll show you guys later for treasure digging? Him and his dad. His brother is not mentioned in these treasure digging things at all. Uh, he's not a part. And what were so, they looking for? <clears throat> treasure. What treasures? Constant, constant. Just, just gold or something? You know, it's, it's speaking of a rabbit hole. <laughs> okay. So they say like, where is the Ark of the Covenant? Right. And then it gets into the whole um, Oak Island thing. Yeah. And this treasure that supposedly this Captain Kid is this treasure they're looking for. Captain Kid's treasure. And that's what the story is behind it. But actually, a lot of people think they're looking for the Ark of the Covenant. Oh, okay. And so very interesting, but mm -hmm. still, this is another one of the symbols. So if you look at that last parchment right here, see mm -hmm. this symbol right yes. here? Yes. Yep. It's identical. There's no way it's not. And it's an actual uh, third good angel of ceremonial magic. I'm going to tell you guys something good or bad. Ceremonial magic is a no. <laughs> um I don't care. Like it, it's it's witchcraft. It's definitely magic. It's you know, and it's to protect him. That's fine and all. So is the other one, but I'm just saying when you start calling down certain angels for things, God didn't send them, right? I'm not saying angels don't help people, but that's why we're not supposed to get in the way of things, right? If God wants to do that, God will do that. But that this is something that they're doing. They're, they're calling these things down this way. They're summoning. And so I don't, I don't think this is a good idea. So that's just my opinion. If you do magic, knock yourself out with it, but I don't think it's a good idea. This is the actual photo also of his ceremonial magic dagger. And it has the seal again, back to Solomonic magic, the seal and intelligence of Mars is engraven on it. And so basically um, when they slice the animal's neck, they don't have to do like invoking and stuff right then because it's already on the dagger. So it's like an immediate prayer over it, like an, a sigil. And so I've talked to, uh, Dr. Justin Sledge, who is an esoteric, a doctor of esoterics. And if people are familiar with esoterica as his channel, like all these things, we've kind of chatted about this. Um, his episode will be coming out soon, but I'm telling you. Like this stuff is well known in other realms, not Mormonism so much, but well known in others. Um, again, like I said, it has Adonai on one side, Scorpio and the intelligence of Mars on another, these seals, see the seal of Mars here. All these seals are in the books of Solomon. So the greater and lesser keys of Solomon, you want to find out what these mean specifically, you can go there. I just put a lot of pictures to prove like this isn't me these aren't my pictures these are real so and again a close-up of the ceremonial handle mm -hmm. so this is a fun little rabbit hole okay so this is an actual newspaper article from the palmyra and it's in 1824 and i'm gonna just condense it and tell you what it basically says it basically says we're gonna dig up joseph smith's oldest brother that died um because people said we dug him up and that we messed with his bones and that we were doing weird necromancy stuff and we didn't so we're going to dig him up to show you we didn't oh that's weird that's not weird at all right like the what why would you do that so that we can prove that it had not been disturbed they ran this six times this is called pre-gaming this is like Okay, we got to run this article because we need something. But also, 
we can't get caught. So we're going to make up the story and run this article. And then if people see us grave digging, we don't look so crazy, right? <laughs> so basically, this angel didn't just cough up those plates right away. This was a process. And every year, Joseph would go back. And the first time, well, it was required that he go back on the fall solstice in all black in the middle of the night. This is not the story we are told. Um, and to go talk to this angel every single year. <laughs> and this is verified in court documents in an affidavit by Willard Chase about how this happened. And there's many accounts of it. So you guys can go look it up. It's real. So basically the angel said, look, uh, you've been coming back and coming back. One time he got punched in the face by a toad. It gets really weird. <laughs> Um, but, and toads are super occult, just so you guys know. So, um, basically the angel says, you got to bring your brother Alvin. He's the one I'll give him to you if you bring Alvin and then Alvin dies. And it's not funny that he died. Possibly he was poisoned <clears throat> because he did die of medication giving to him by his physician for constipation. A little strange. Um, so he dies. And he can't bring him. So instead, he brings his new wife, Emma. And Emma, this is just the ticket showing that he was indeed cited for treasure looking and glass looker, all this stuff. And he got found found guilty and had to pay $2.68, which he never paid. Um, so he brings Emma instead. And shortly after that, Emma has a baby because they're married and stuff he gets the plates and she has the baby and the baby is severely disfigured and only lives a few moments and dies and they name the baby the dead brother's name alvin okay now we're going to get into faustian bargains something that is really important on a faustian bargain is a firstborn son when all this jazz started happening with these plates and Joseph couldn't get them, what happens? The oldest son dies accidentally, supposedly, because he had constipation. Okay. And then he has a son and he names it that name and it's completely disfigured and distorted. And then they name that baby the same name. I'm just saying, I don't have any proof on that one other than that those things happened. But it's interesting. Mm -hmm. right? These are the characters on the bottom here of the actual Book of Mormon characters. Remember, I told you they would write certain symbols down, not necessarily words. These are the actual symbols. And this is a real piece from them because they tried to get them verified by Anton, Charles Anton. And they wanted to see if they were reformed Egyptians. So they take them to this linguist guy and he's like okay yeah i'll verify him blah 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 and then he's like wait where did you get these from though and they're like yeah we got them from the angels and he's like give me that like i'm not no we're not doing that and they're like can i have my paperback and then he's like no you can't have your paperback so <laughs> um that's why that we have that but if you look at the top sorry that's touchy that is the enochian alphabet above it from john d and the angels so people can look at that closer from comparisons. It's not exact. It's very similar. Mm -hmm. And they called it reformed Egyptian. Which it was not. It was a, he didn't know anything about that. I have to turn down this because it's a little. Now, this gets out of Joseph Smith land and into the temple rites that we do as Mormons. Now, interesting enough. Joseph Smith had received his Masonic temple rites only three to four weeks before he made this ceremony for Mormons. Funny thing is, they call Mormonism masonry for the whole family, right? They, they make a joke about this because women can do it too, sort of. I mean, they're still subservient and stuff, but um, they can go and do these rites. Whereas in masonry, uh, the women have their own thing, you know? they have their own group and so i kind of feel like this helped get him killed in a way because he was killed um he was murdered 
Yes. <gasps> so um, shortly after getting the Book of Mormon and translating the plates and doing all of that stuff, um, he was driven out because he was sleeping with everyone's wives. Um, and he would be like, hey, Brother Pratt or whatever, you're you need to go serve a mission in Timbuktu to the natives while I bang your wife. OK, even nowadays in Mormonism, this is not OK because <laughs> He was actually polyamorous. He wasn't, he wasn't being with just women that were not married, right? Like he was, he was being a polygamist as well as being with women that were already married. And so that's not done at all in the Mormon church. And so even he was like doing things that we, you wouldn't see the FLDS do today. They would not do that. Um, and so he was taking very young wives and he was doing stuff against the Masons. I don't know if you know about the anti-Mason movement. No. But the last guy that did some anti-Mason stuff, William Morgan, had a disappearance and he never showed back up. Okay. They don't play. They're not playing with you. Like even nowadays, I mean, I think it's way less, but right. They're influential. You hear Mason, you're like, oh. Oh, okay. You know, you, what are you up to? Like, what what's going on there? And, and it's a secret society, but like he was out trying to be against the Masons. And then one day he just wasn't there anymore. So funny enough, Joseph Smith did wear, marry his wife. <laughs> yeah. So it's a whole, like you said, it's in everything. Like if we go down each rabbit hole, it's like a 12 hour thing, but like, I can't even figure out where it ends anymore. You know, like <laughs> I, I was like stop. not prepared. Yeah. I was not prepared for the rabbit hole. I fell in like at all. <laughs> and so I just thought, oh, well, this is bad because blah, blah, blah. And then I'm like, wait, no, it's something else. Oh, shoot. Something else. It, it never stops. It, it, oh, now it's linked to money. Oh, now we're linked to new world order. Yes. <gasps> all of that. All of it. God. We'll get there. But this is some of the creepy crap we do in the temple. Now, this is a reenactment. I want people to know that. But I will tell you, I've done it. I've been there a lot. And it's pretty spot on. Now, they have made uh, tweaks to it because people were like super weird and freaky. The one where they say they'll slice their throat and you'll see them do it. They don't do that anymore. I'm pretty sure I know why. Because... And funny enough, the Mormons changed it, but the Masons followed within nine months. So you tell me they're not hooked together. Hmm. So they took it out. It's only now a part of the OTO, Order Tem Ordo Templi Orientis, which is not Christian. Look that up. Um, long story short, this is the ceremony of making men gods. So we shall play this and we'll talk about it. I just like to warn people first. What you are seeing is an authentic first time ever on film reenactment of secret Mormon temple ceremonies that even most Mormons have never seen. And those who have, have sworn never to reveal these secrets under penalty of death. The execution of the penalty is represented by placing the right thumb under the left ear, drawing the thumb quickly across the throat to the right ear, and dropping the hand to the side. All of us who've been through the temple have sworn solemn oaths consenting to having our throat slit and our heart and our vitals thrown, torn out. The execution of the penalty is represented by drawing the thumb quickly across the body and dropping the hands to the side. In the Mormon temple marriage, the partners are sealed to each other for time and all eternity in mason-like rituals. And without this ceremony, no one can enter the presence of Joseph Smith and become a god. Hey, lay, air. Brother Pratt, having authority, I wash you preparatory to receiving your anointings for and in behalf of John Kimball, who is dead, that you may become clean from the blood and sins of this generation. Sister Bradford, I wash you preparatory to you receiving your anointings for and in behalf of Eliza Barrett. Eliza Barrett, who is dead, that you may become clean from the blood and sins of this generation. I wash your head, that your brain and intellect may become clear and active. 
your eyes that you may see clearly and discern between truth and error. Thousands of occultic ceremonies each day are performed for the dead so that they too can receive the benefits of Mormonism. Mormons are encouraged to have encounters with the dead. And it's not uncommon for demons impersonating the dead to appear to Mormons stating that they've been converted to the Mormon church in the spirit world and now want their family history traced. Your loins that you may be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth that you may have joy in your posterity. Your vitals and bowels that they may be strong and healthy and perform their proper function. Your breast that it may be the receptacle of pure and virtuous principles. Okay, so that was the God Makers. Um, it's creepy. So it is creepy. when I when I went through, you got naked. My great <gasps> you got wait naked in front of all those people. Wait, wait. You get naked and put that poncho on. That thing that she was wearing that looked like a sheet is like a poncho, but it's sliced all the way up, and like it's just open. And I was super pregnant, and so <clears throat> you're just in the back room with a woman. And, and this led me down a weird rabbit hole because I was like, a woman can't give a blessing. And I was like, wait, you can't give me a blessing. Why are you touching me and talking to me? Like, go get the guy. Like, you can't do it. You're not a 12 year old boy has more authority in the Mormon church than a grown up woman. And I was like, you don't, you don't have the authority to do this. And so I told my grandma that, and I was like, what's going on with this? She's like, no, no, it's just different in the temple. And I was like, okay whatever so it was my first time I was already freaked out half naked in this dressing room <laughs> and nobody saw me except the ladies back there okay you're by yourself but now they've changed it into like a baptism suit that you zip up because a lot of people felt how I felt and my great grandma turned around and said well when I went they scrubbed you in a bathtub naked and I was like oh my gosh yeah. And so, yeah, so also this part has been changed, but the women no longer have to veil their faces because we don't have the priesthood. <laughs> we had to do that forever. These um, aprons are green. It's just a bad tint on the photo because he snuck it. He snuck in. Shout out to what's his name? New name something. But he went in and, and he got all this footage with like glasses or something. I don't know. But um, yeah, new name Noah way to go him um these are very reminiscent one breasted robes that go over the top of our clothes um oto members you'll recognize that what do you see we don't want to do that again sorry that. <laughs> um this is the actual color of the apron it and it's fig leaves like representative of fig leaves and these are some of the signs and penalties that we do so we go through and we get that preparatory uh, cleaning, whatever done, and they bless our bowels and our whatever, everything. And then you go into this room like um, Adam and Eve, like the Garden of Eden. And you're going through this whole skit of how the universe came to be. And it used to be a play. It used to be live. But now, especially after 2020, everything's a video. And actually, I've heard they quit doing the video and went to slides because so many people left the church that some of the people were apostates in the movie. <laughs> That's funny. Um, and so now I guess it's just a slideshow thing. So then you get to go through fake to fake heaven. You get a new name and you're never supposed to tell anyone that name. Your husband tells his name to the guy behind the veil who's fake God and you don't ever get to know it because you're just a dumb girl. And then um, you tell your name to your husband because there's no salvation without him, ladies. Um, remember that for Mormons. Your salvation and your priesthood blessings come from your husband. And I don't I don't really get into uh, being a feminist or whatever, but still, that's not the best. Um, they do all these creepy things. And this thing in the center, if anybody ever, well, I guess it's not the center, off to the side here where they've got their hands up. Mm -hmm. If anybody ever says, can we put your name on the temple list? I'm going to explain to you what that means before you say, yeah. There's a printout of all the names that they call in through the week or however often they do them. And they put them in this box in the middle of these people. Why they chant and raise their arms up and down calling out weird things, Pele L. Um, there's a lot of 
back and forth about what that means. And I'm not going to get into it because some people say it's demonic and some people say it's not. And it's just a whole big thing. So that's what they said. Now they say, oh, God, hear the words of my mouth because they changed it. I don't know why we're changing things straight from God, if it really is straight from God, but there it is. So they chant around it and do these Masonic weird things. So just so you know, if you say, yeah, that's what they're going to do. They're not praying like, oh God, pray for these. They're, they're doing this weird stuff. So just think about that. Is and this then, all Mormons? Regular yes, Mormons do this? Yes. This is absolutely mainstream church. This wow. is what I did. <clears throat> this is why they call it. It's sacred, not secret. And I'm like, well, it's, secret is, <laughs> it's secret is crap because none of us would have done it if we knew, well, like very few of us, right? Like if they had told me all this stuff before I went, I don't know if I'd have been there. And they do give you a chance to be like, oh, well, you, if anybody wants to stand up and leave, remember, it's the best day of your life. You're, <laughs> this is like everything you've worked for since you were two years old. Cause they've ingrained this in your brain, like 2000 times, way more than that a year probably 2000 times a year before, you know, you're young. And before you go that you got to get married in the temple. If you know any Mormons, that's a huge deal. You got to get married in the temple, got to get married in the temple. Everything's about getting married in the temple. And so if you don't get married in the temple, these signs and, and seals like these little, and your special underwear, we'll get there. But these handshakes, <laughs> if you don't know the handshakes, you can't go to heaven because you can't pass by the angels and sentinels that guard the veil and they actually have a curtain with holes in it and you have to stick your little hand in there and, and do these now the first time you do all this jazz and get your new name and do all this crap for yourself but people go to the temple all the time right so why do they go oh now we're gonna plug in the genealogy key because dead people because every single time after you go for the first time you're doing it for a dead person and they did Hitler and they did Marilyn Monroe and they did what? Obama's mom and they did all the Jews that died for what they believed in, including Anne Frank until the Jewish people were like, um, can you stop now? And they said, yes, but then they did it again. So funny enough, they're doing necromancy. They're literally doing this and you are the proxy for a dead person. So when you get there, they give you a name that's why he said for Eliza Barrett, and that wasn't her name. He said by proxy for Eliza Barrett. And that is because you are stepping in for dead people. They also baptize dead people, but the kids do that. Mm -hmm. And this is very common. This is not, if you ask a kid that's very devout in the LDS mainstream Mormon church, that's 14. Have you ever done baptisms for the dead? They'll say, sure. Yeah. Absolutely. They did them in this, in this font. Let me show you. Oh, we got to go back one right there. That wow. is with usually the oxen are golden, but not in this picture. That's fine. It does remind me of, and people are like, oh, it's the 12 tribes of Israel. Cool. And yes, it's exact replica of Solomon's. Yeah. Okay. So we're back to Solomonic magic. Also, <laughs> You can't see out there and nobody's allowed in there except like people that are witnessing this. We don't know who they are and you're half naked and you're a kid, right? Like you're getting wet and it's all, all see-through and it's weird. And you're getting baptized up to, I think it's eight times. So eight dead people, bam, 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 you know? And so you do this all the time and then you go get ice cream. So, <laughs> so weird. It is really weird. And if they let the cat out of the bag more, people wouldn't do it. And also, this is the garments you get along with your new name. You get undergarments and you um, have the square and compass on. Now, I found this very interesting hmm. uh, on That's... your orifices, right? Breasts have openings. So does a belly button. The mm -hmm. sideways ruler also. And it just screams invocation for me. I... And then there's no other markings except on the right knee because they say every knee shall bow. And mm. I guess I, I'm going to correct myself here in past ones. They were very expensive when I was young and went through. 
now I guess they've way lowered the price, which is good because they should have, because they used to be $30 a piece and now they're not. And that's good because you need a lot of pairs of underwear. You have to wear <laughs> these closest to your skin. You can't what? wear your bra underneath. <clears throat> your bra. You can't wear your bra underneath this. You have to put your bra over the garment and, and your lady time. Let me blow this up so that you can see the, I don't know in the Mormon church who has a crotch this long. I just want to know why <laughs> on earth the woman's crotch is like two feet long. It's ridiculous. <laughs> Look at it's gapping and it does. And it's horrible because when your lady time happens, it's a problem and you can't wear underwear underneath them. So it's a whole situation. And that and, is oh, so weird. Postpartum is even more fun. And like yeah. It's all so what's the point of wearing these underpants <laughs> undergarments? So these are magical underpants. So every Mormon <laughs> will tell you, no, I get it. dude. <laughs> I wore them for a long time and I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I did this, but I did. <laughs> and this is why you'll never see a Mormon woman that's gone through the temple in like a sleeveless outfit because of, of these garments would show you can't ever wear that again, as long as you're alive. And so you can only take these off if mm -hmm. you are showering, of course, mm -hmm. like getting a new pair. Cause they're like underwear. You change them, you know, all the time. People are like, what if they get, st I'm like, no, you just buy, they're just like underwear. Mm -hmm. You buy new ones. If they get stained, just like regular underwear, you know? Um, but anyways, you can only take them off when you shower. If you go swimming, if you go to the gym and if you're making more Mormons and then you have to put them <laughs> directly back on. <laughs> yeah immediately back on no sleeping Ugh. naked none of that fun jazz this like has to just... be on this is your pjs yes at all times these are. and so um some people get really crazy about it and they're like yeah my mom never even took them off on the top or whatever like when they did business or like they would take off one arm and then put the arm in you know so they were never wow. uncovered ever get so, now i'm going to tell people that's just people people and Mm. They never said that. Right. They just said, like, you're supposed to wear them at all times. Okay. And that means some things to some people and other things to other people. So, you know, it is what it is. But um, I will say all the seams in this part, like in the crotch area, makes me wonder if there is, is a sign in there that we don't know about. Because mm. I find it interesting that it's over orifices, right? Like, mm, seems unusual. They wouldn't put one where the main... You mean like in them? Yeah, these signs are actually sewed. Well, now they're screen printed on. Uh huh. Oh. Um, but these are like on your clothes. Like they're there. Oh. And you mean that mm -hmm. Masonic sign that? Yep. Mm -hmm. Is in, in those areas. That is yes. so weird. That's why they call it magical garments. Yep, that's why. Oh. And most people do not oh. know these are Masonic symbols at all. Um. I didn't know. You want to know what I thought they were? Cause I was so ridiculous. This is <laughs> what the, I thought they were, um, darts like sewing darts for nipple area. <laughs> Cause I didn't know. And I had no idea they were Masonic, but these first ones look, if people want to go search this out, look very much like the Jewish, um, the, the Jewish people with the ringlets. I can't remember, but they, they wear undergarments as well. They, oh, do and they? they have a string out the back. You can see them. Yeah. Oh. And so uh, people say Joseph Smith never read the Kabbalah. My ass. They mm. did too. Um, and so they've definitely changed over the years. They used to just be one piece and really uncomfortable, but now they're like a Hanes t-shirt and boxer briefs, you know, Wow. But so for women, it's do, worse. <clears throat> after you do that baptism, you get these clothes. No, after you go oh, through and get yes. your temple, your temple. Ceremony. And so the boys do it at 18, usually when they're going through uh, the temple, because they get them then. Um, and the girls, I guess somebody did say the girls can go at 18. Now I know they used to make the girls wait till 21 because they wanted us to get married. I see. And so they're big on that. But somebody said they did change that. So apparently they changed that. Um, also those missions are paid for by those people. Yes. The church kicks in money, but they have to pay, I think it's like $900 a month or something. Um, they make it standard across the board. So like if you go to Hawaii, it's super expensive. If you go to Detroit, it's super cheap, but they just make it one, one payment across the board per month. Wow. 
They yes. want them to go, but they got to pay for it pretty they much. They got to pay for it. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and if you don't go, honestly, like you come home early or you don't go, like it's a notch down to get married. Like people are wow. like, oh, you're not a return missionary. Mm, I don't know. <laughs> oh yeah. my God. Yeah. Cause it's, it's, you know, a thing. And mm -hmm. that this is um, the apron. That's the apron. So, the, the green apron. That's is a Masonic one. apron. This is a Masonic apron. And this was Satan's apron. <gasps> but before, because Satan does pop up in our little temple uh, talk, and he's the one that gives us the apron of green fig leaves. And he says, well, you should put this on and, and you know, uh, cover yourself. And we take the apron and everyone stands and they go, please stand and put on your apron. And I always thought, why are we doing what Satan said to do? That seems weird, but he has this apron. And so this is the Masonic apron. Um, and it, now he wears a dark one. Now he just wears a dark, like blackish type one. But back before the sixties, he wore this and my grandma remembered this. So yeah, this was a thing. Is there um, somebody standing in there as Satan's place and has this yes. apron on? Yes. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. It's a full play. Wow. And if it's not a play, I guess anymore, they do slides, I suppose, but they would put the slide up of say, a Satan. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. it, there's actually a hilarious TikTok and people are like all dressed in their temple garments. Not well, their whole outfit. And they're like, and then why did they make Satan hot in the video? And it shows Satan <laughs> back in the day. And it, it was kind of funny. I was like, ha, oh, that's hilarious. But um, Mormon humor. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah. These are not the Mormon signs and symbols. These are similar to the signs and symbols of Mormonism. Huh. I like to show this because this is what Joseph did. We'll use the last one as an example. The real grip of a master mason or the lion's paw. Well, in Mormonism, it's the true sign of the nail, like Jesus, like touching where the nail was. So he just kind of Christianized them and stole them. He did. I mean... Like, that's all freemason stuff <clears throat> oh sure it is for sure and to prove Ooh. so just so you know mormons are never 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 to show those signs and symbols i just showed you we're not supposed to talk about them with our kids not huh. even if they're going to the temple tomorrow do you show them you're never supposed to show them in general you're never supposed to do them in public, except if you're the president of the church and you meet the president of the United States. Oh. And then I guess you can just bust it out for the world to see because that's not. <laughs> wow. Like, Interesting. Yeah. So he, that guy is a Mormon guy with Bush? Yes, he was. Mm -hmm. He was the president of the church. Uh, oh. This is Thomas S. Monson. Why are they meeting? And, yeah. Why are they meeting? Interesting. <laughs> yeah. Um. They meet quite often. Also, huh. just for fun facts, Russell M. Nelson, the current, this is him, uh, president of the church, prophet, seer, and revelator. He's doing, you notice he's doing one of the signs on this little statue. I noticed weird. it right away. You're yeah, never weird. supposed to do it in public. He's 100 years old. Not only is was he a surgeon, but he was a member of Skull and Bones chapter of University oh of Utah. And Allen Key, which is Scroll and Key at Yale. Yes, the members of Yale University came and actually sanctioned the opening of the Skull and Bones at University of Utah. This is verified everywhere. You can go look it up. That's it's weird. all over his biography that he was in it. Yeah. So, um, Skull and Bones. So we get even deeper. And these are the signs and symbols all over the Salt Lake City Temple, which are <laughs> oh pentagrams, sunstones, moonstones, cloud stones, Masonic handshakes. And right now they're renovating the temple. And mm. I do believe you will not see these symbols anymore. I uh, think they're going to take them off. They're going to they're they're gonna gonna secret that. Uh. Mm -hmm. Yep. I think you will not see these anymore. And also kind of funny enough, and this is just me being silly or maybe not phallus opening phallus opening. <gasps> oh my phallus god <laughs> you're right Bunch of phalluses off to the side i'm like well <laughs> i mean okay maybe it isn't but Interesting. whatever <clears throat> yeah wow 
So also they always have on the top, the angel Moroni, which is usually supposed to be gold. Yeah. When we get into the loose stealing. What is a conduction? Okay. So if you've got all these people doing these weird necromancy ceremonies that they don't know anything about, why would you do that? Why would you even have them do that if they don't know what they're doing? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why indeed? Because possibly you're making energy. You're still doing the thing mm. that makes um, things happen and you're harnessing that energy out the top of these spires. It often makes me wonder that is speculation on my part, by the way, people, that is the only part so far that is speculation unless I've said so. Um, the rest of this stuff is documented and you can go look it up. Like I'm not making this up. This is real. Um, so yeah, it's, that is the slideshow. Um, awesome. I'm open to any questions for sure, but I just think it's very interesting. All of these things like that is just a quick and dirty, um, low down, you know, and I, wow. I just think it's really, uh, interesting situation when you find all this out. That is so deep, Heidi. Oh my God. <laughs> it is. It, you can see yeah. it. I mean, once you know that you know. that's, you know, exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And once crazy. you know, it's Solomonic magic, yeah. you know, that they're not doing it for nothing. Like, mm -hmm. come on. Why would they make all these people that are completely oblivious? We don't know. The normal people do not know. Yeah. Right. These are no. normies. So why would you make them do it if it wasn't yep. to help you? And what does necromancy provide to people? Okay, why do people do it? It says, if you look up, why do people do necromancy? It says to give them powers and knowledge. And what do mm. we call of the future, especially? And what do we call the president of the church? Prophet, seer, and revelator. Like these are, this is a direct communication and they're using it for their purposes. And I didn't even get into the witchcraft with the mirrors on ceilings. When you get married into the temple, you look in these mirrors that are facing each other. So it goes on forever and ever and ever and ever. Who only knows what you're invoking into your marriage? Oh that way? <gasps> yeah. Yeah. It's scary. And with sex magic, cause usually they're virgins and usually they've never been together before. And then, you know, you go home and you know, what's going to happen. So like you do that right before. And so is it sealed later? I'd like to know. But I funny wonder. enough, yeah, funny enough, as much as they hold women down in the church, the top secret, secret, secret thing that they do in the church called the second anointing is a blessing where your place is made sure. So Jesus will not judge them in the afterlife. Supposedly, they've already been judged here on earth and they can do anything except murder. And that includes pedo stuff everything and still go to heaven and because their place has been made sure and that includes stealing like this is why so many of the top top can do all these nefarious things right except murder and they still can go to heaven but that blessing is sealed so one of the 12 apostles washes your feet like jesus in the temple and then there's a second part to this ritual where you go home in your bedroom sex magic and your wife seals your head with a blessing your wife the very last and final thing that you get from the church on blessings is sealed by a woman and that's because and this is why that lady could give me the blessing this is the answer to the question that i asked and my grandma wouldn't tell me it's because she has become a priestess that's what they call it or a goddess and she can do those rites and rituals now because she's had the second anointing. I'm sorry, yes. but when you're harnessing energy, feminine energy like that and sex magic and all this stuff, like this goes down a weird place. That's yeah. Alistair Crowley stuff. That's Absolutely. crazy. Oh my God. Yeah. No one would ever think that Mormon churches do these things at all. I didn't, I never knew. Yeah. I, I think I, I heard you very recently, obviously you just started your podcast. I heard very recently some of the things that you were saying, and I was blown away. And then when I talked to Jesse and she's telling me this stuff, I'm like, no way. 
That's yeah. crazy. And, and the thing is, is there, this goes even deeper to the one world order, because remember, yeah. Joseph Smith is not supposed to have known things, right? Because he was supposedly a non-learned guy or whatever, right? He, mm -hmm. he's this guy, whatever. So there's something called, um, the organization of the order of Enoch that started by Joseph Smith. You obviously knew about Enoch because he named it this. They kind of hide <laughs> this for this reason. And it's basically an order where they all get together and live communally. And the, everything's put in the prophet's name at the top. The FLDS still live this way to this day. The FLDS, um, everything is put in the prophet's name. And actually, that's why when he got in trouble, Warren Jeffs, and got arrested, they were able to take that town and a lot of his belongings and everything because it was under his name. Even the houses that the people built, they're only allowed to build there. They never own the land, ever. Wow. And so this is like their, I guess, idea, basically. And this is back in 1831, this was started, that they should all live communally and give everything, basically, even houses, factories, towns, everything to the prophet and live like all together as like communistically. And what does the new world order want to do with people? You know, give give it to the top and everybody else has to do frugal living within a social mm -hmm. and economic enclave. That is literally from the words of this organization. And wow. so... I'm just saying like very interesting when you look that stuff up, United yeah. Order of Enoch, you guys can look it up. It's yeah. such a deep rabbit hole. And was the Mormon head guy, um, John, John, Joseph Smith, Joseph Smith, jo yes. was he, I thought I read, but I don't know if it was him or another cult was choked by an angel. He was, um, I don't know if they choked him i know he got punched he might have been <laughs> got i'm punched like trying by a, to remember a toad that is ridiculous by a toad. and they <laughs> covered it up you know the church is so smart they covered it up this book called the salamander stories <clears throat> if you tell somebody joseph smith got punched by a toad they'll say no no you're thinking of the salamander in this story by mark hoffman who was a liar who killed a bunch of people with bombs well, he killed two and he's currently alive and in prison today. Um, but, but he was, uh, a forger and he would, he hated the church, but he had to like go along to get along. And so he started forging all these funny documents and selling them to the church because the church doesn't want stuff out like that. And they're like, Oh yeah, we'll buy that. Don't put that out. Right. Like, so he started doing this and kind of shaking the church down. Well, I think my personal opinion is I think they might have had something to do with him being arrested because he was singing like a canary um, before and saying like, oh, this and this and this against the church, blah, 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 blah. But then all of a sudden he tried to not wake up one day and take too much of his medication, I guess. And no one checked on him for 12 Yes, I said 12 hours on death row. Oh, okay. For 12 hours, he laid on the ground on his arm and no one saw him, but they're supposed to do rounds all the time. Okay. And all of a sudden he quit talking because his right arm was paralyzed and that was his forging arm. And he never <laughs> will forge anything again. You tell me they didn't get him. Like, it makes you wonder, did they set him up just to take that fall? And did they do it? Yeah. But like, you can't prove any of that. I'm sure he right. will never say. Right, so. right. Wow. Yep. That is so crazy, Heidi. Oh, my God. Well, <laughs> <laughs> there's so much we can, so many different rabbit holes that we can continue on. But I want to thank you for sharing your yes, incredible journey. That's it, it was incredible. Um, it takes a lot of courage to speak openly about leaving the faith. It's definitely not easy to talk about, um, especially one that's been deeply ingrained, such as Mormonism and Heidi, your honesty and your willingness to explore all this, you know, it just um, challenges and triumphs. 
Thank your you. experiences will no doubt, I believe, resonate with many of our listeners. So thank you so much again for bringing your insights and wisdom um, to the show. Um, I think it's going to help a lot of people who might be in a similar path, hopefully. You know, I know, I know you're not supposed to look at other things when you're in the, in the church, because they tell you not to, you yep. know, don't look at other things that are talking against the church. Of course, they're anti-Mormon. They say, yeah. Yes. Yep. So they'll, so, but hopefully if, if they can, maybe a friend or a relative that is not so deeply in can share something like this with them. Cause I think it's important that they know this stuff. So. And if you want to go forward, like, and do it, if you have the knowledge and it's your choice, that is a very different thing yep. than being lied to. And that That's is true. why I speak out. If the church yep. would come clean and start just saying what it is, then maybe I wouldn't talk about this anymore, you know, but yep. I did lose yep. everything when I, I came out. Yeah. I, I lost did. my family. Yeah, yeah. They, they don't speak to me. And, you know, it, it, it's okay at this point, but like, it's a hard thing to do. That's a hard choice to make. Yeah. Because yeah. your whole life is this, everything mm -hmm. the people you probably do business with the people that you hang out with, you go to church with these people, everything you hang out with these people, yeah. every, your whole life is involved. So I yes. understand that's, yep. that's why I say this is not easy for you to do. So I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, a lot I of... just want to help people. And that's my thing, know. you know, like one, one person doesn't go through because of it. Cool. You know what I mean? Yeah. That would be good. So yeah, exactly. Yep. And, um, if you guys didn't see me on other platforms or check out my episodes, uh, we're going to be releasing the hundredth episode today. Oh so my I'm God. Excited. That yes. is exciting. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so where can people find you, Heidi? Yes, I'm at the Unfiltered Rise podcast everywhere podcasts are served. I do have um, the Unfiltered Rise podcast.com and I do have a Patreon where I do two extra shows a month so that I never have to cut my episodes because I hate that. Um, and I'll give you extra ones for five bucks a month. And they're all about the other side of Mormonism, the murder, Mormons, and mayhem, which, by the way, Ted Bundy was a Mormon. So we no get into all kinds of fun <laughs> things. Yeah. <laughs> So go there for some fun. Yeah. Check it out. That thank you crazy. again for having me on. I appreciate you so much. No, thank you, Heidi. And is love your real last name? It's my middle name. Oh, it's my cool. real. Yep. It's my real middle name. And I just don't awesome. put my last name out I, just because yeah. I live in Utah. <laughs> I know <laughs> of all places, That's right? Fine. That is yeah. crazy. <laughs> yep. And now we have kids that are settled here and having babies. Oh, so we We'll be here. Yeah. Yeah. No choice. Do people yep. know who you are and kind of give you that funny look? Sometimes. Yeah. So I, but see, they don't watch. Different. Yeah. It's they but don't sometimes, watch. sometimes people say stuff and I'm like, why are you watching my channel? Turn yeah, <laughs> exactly. You're not supposed to be watching. Uh, yeah. Don't watch my channel. <laughs> but Especially if they have okay. a problem with it. That's yeah. Sure. We keep it on the hush. Cause we don't want my kids like not being able to play. It's of already course. hard. Yeah, absolutely. Hard. So, oh my yeah. goodness. It's all right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Heidi. I really appreciate your time. And that brings us to an end of another episode. I want to thank my special guest, Heidi Love, for taking the time to share her incredible insights into the mystical side and the history of Mormonism. Your journey and knowledge have truly added to the depths of this conversation. And we hope this message Heidi brings can help others who may need it, whether they're considering leaving Mormonism or just simply seeking to understand it better. And to all our listeners, don't forget to share this episode, follow the podcast, subscribe and leave a review. Your support not only helps keep this show free, but also helps us grow our Ohana and to continue bringing you these thought-provoking discussions. Until the next time, guys. Ahui ho kako. Bye. You and I, we had some kind of vibe. You drove me crazy, all you brought out was my bad side. And when I held you wide, I had to hold you tight. Because I never thought I'd find a girl like you. I couldn't think of my